This is David Joyner. I'm a professor of mathematics in the U.S. Naval Academy. And I'm going to show you how to use SAGE to do some computations with Fourier series. SAGE is a free mathematics program, open source mathematics program available from sagemath.org. You can download it there. You can also try it online uh, it, uh, for free. You just get an account on sagenb.org. There's also lots of uh, documentation there, tutorials, uh, video tutorials also. There are email lists you can um, join if you want to ask questions. Uh, lots of things available about SAGE on sagemath.org. I'll be using SAGE um, in fact, this is a live version of SAGE. Uh, this um, document here is called a SAGE Notebook Worksheet. Uh, we're working within what's called the SAGE Notebook. It actually is uh, running SAGE via a browser or displaying the SAGE output via a, a browser here. And um, uh, I'll be posting this uh, worksheet. Uh, it's called an SWS file. Uh, to this uh, web page here. Um, the link is at the bottom of this worksheet, but uh, so you'll see it later, but basically you can see it right there. So already been posted on the internet. So if you want to run through this yourself, you can. Then to load the worksheet, you go to File Load. See right there. Okay, let's start off with a short introduction to Fourier series. Um, uh, Joseph Fourier was a physicist who was a very strong proponent of using uh, these uh, trigonometric series to solve the heat equation and was uh, uh, so uh, strongly believed in them that he actually um, uh, has now has them named after him. Um, so Fourier series were named after a physicist, a French physicist named Joseph Fourier. Um, he was also a scientific advisor for Napoleon during the late 1800s and later became um, a professor in the French university system in the uh, early 1800s. In uh, 1807 he published a memoir called On the Propagation of Heat and Solid Bodies which he had been, work been working on for many years. I believe he started working on this in the late 1700s. But that is the book that basically published his solution to the heat equation and we'll be discussing very briefly that solution uh, using SAGE later. The first, uh, some introduction, a uh, quick introduction to Fourier series if you haven't uh, seen them before. I'll use uh, an analogy with Taylor series. Taylor series, as you probably know, are a way of re-expressing a function in terms of a sum or a linear combination of simpler functions, namely powers of x. So for example, if you had e to the x, you might have a hard time computing e to the 1.5 or something, but it wouldn't be too hard to compute 1.5 to various powers. So if you knew the power series expansion or the Taylor expansion of e to the x, then you could get, uh, for example, e to the 1.5. Well, Sage uh, computes Taylor series uh, very easily. There's a method called Taylor and you can see an illustration right here. If you want just the first four terms, uh, you'll see that uh, Sage tells you that it's 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 6. And each of those subsums, these partial sums, 1 plus x, 1 plus x plus x squared over 2, and then 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 6, those different partial sums give you different approximations to e to the x, to different levels of um, approximation. You can see here's uh, the, the e to the x function is this solid blue. This dashed line is 1 plus x. The next line is dot dashed is uh, 1 plus x plus x squared over 2. And then we get this dotted line which is a better approximation and that's the all four terms. So you can see if you're going uh, from minus 2 to 2, then the four terms of the Taylor series give you a pretty good approximation. If you want to go from minus 3 to 3, you should probably get a few more terms of the Taylor series approximation. But you can use a Taylor series to approximate more complicated functions. We'll use the same idea to uh, introduce a Fourier series. 
Fourier series are not going to be sums of powers of x, but rather uh, sums of uh, trig functions, cosines and sines like you see here. Now, since cosines and sines are periodic, what we're doing is we're only representing periodic functions as linear combinations of cosines and sines. But if you take a, a, a function in f of x and you rewrite it as a linear combination of cosines and sines, there actually are nice formulas for these ans and bn's. There's the so-called Fourier series coefficients. Uh, here they are right here. These uh, Fourier series coefficient formulas actually are due to Der Schley. I don't believe Fourier knew of these formulas himself. So let's take an example. Uh, look at a function f of x uh, from minus pi to pi, which is piecewise constant. It's minus 1 from minus pi to 0, 2 from 0 to pi over 2, and 1 from pi over 2 to pi. And uh, let's use Sage to plot that piecewise constant function. Not hard to do that. Sage has a command called piecewise. You can put uh, piecewise defined functions together pretty easily. And you can plot them. There's the plot right there, that blue line plot solid blue line plot. Also, Sage can compute the ANs and the BNs symbolically. Just take N to be a symbolic variable like that, and you do the computation as the, of the integrals, the 1 over L, integral minus L to L, that stuff there. Oops. Um, and you can see the ANs and the BNs are computed right there. And now we use Sage to compute the uh, several terms of the Fourier series. This is called a partial sum when you only take a small number of terms of the Fourier series. And so let's compute the partial sum using Sage and then plot that. If we take the first uh, six, uh, by mistake I said five here, but there are actually six terms here, and uh, add them together, you can see you get a, an approximation to f of x, but it's not a very good approximation. It is uh, trying to hug that curve, but <laughs> it's doing a pretty bad job. Six terms don't do a good job here. So let's try more. Uh, here are 13 terms. You do get a better approximation. Still not so good. You can see it's a little bit better here than it is, for example, here, but um, still pretty bad. So let's take more. This is about 100 terms now. And now it's, it's fairly good. You can actually see it's doing a really good job in the middle there using red dots instead because this uh, graph is so good it's really hard to tell the difference unless you use red dots. Uh, but it does um, have a overshoot where there are these jumps. This overshoot is a common phenomenon for discontinuous functions. Uh, uh, Fourier series will do a good job of approximating in the middle where it's nice and continuous but where there's this jump discontinuity there's this uh, phenomenon due to that's called the Gibbs phenomenon, G-I-B-B-S. Gibbs was a professor at Yale about uh, 100 years ago or so, and um, he noticed that by using, um, actually he computed Fourier series using a mechanical calculator instead of, you know, uh, this is, those are pre-computer days. Um, now, uh, one of the problems with Fourier series, as I mentioned, is this... Um, problem that it doesn't do a good job approximating at these jumps. Uh, now there is a lot of um, theory that goes into improving that uh, approximation ability um, using what are called filters, but to explain that you really need to know something about signal processing, so I'm going to skip that, but I just will notice that using SAGE you actually can make the convergence much better. This is using only uh, f about 50 terms. You can see it's nice and smooth and there's no over jumps at all using Cesaro filters. Uh, Sage has quite a few filters that are implemented. Uh, you see Cesaro here, uh, Han filters are here, and you can even build your own filters here. Your filter here would be F. So if you want more information, um, you might want to look into a book on uh, signal processing and then notice that Sage actually will have some of that implemented for you. Okay, enough of uh, approximations, using Fourier series to do approximations of functions. Um, let's look at it, see how Fourier series can help us understand the physics of sound. If you look at, for example, the sound of a flute. Hopefully you heard that okay. That is a flute playing the note uh, A4. 
and uh, you can see um, here this is Audacity and it is displaying the actual um, the, the actual audio file there this uh, pattern here this periodic pattern is called a waveform and the question since that waveform as you noticed was nice and periodic question for us is can we somehow come up with coefficients a n and b n that match those and add them up and use Fourier series to approximate that waveform so if we let f of t denote that waveform t now is uh, to represents time uh, if f of t is that waveform of the flute can we come up with coefficients a n and b n um, and so these add up to give us that waveform. Well, these uh, terms in the Fourier series are actually called harmonics in uh, physics and in uh, music theory. So can we come up with a sequence of these uh, simple harmonics that add up together to give us that uh, waveform of the flute? Well, the, um, what we, uh, there's another piece of terminology, the an uh, squared plus bn squared square root is called the amplitude of that nth harmonic. And um, when you look at, um, uh, there's various websites that actually tabulate for you the waveforms and the amplitudes. Uh, so here's a waveform of a flute, and there are the amplitudes that have been comp com computed. And um, this uh, uh, function here I came up with really by trial and error. Um, because the amplitudes tell you, the, this uh, first line here, for example, does tell you what a1 squared plus a2 squared square root is. I'm sorry, a1 squared plus b1 squared square root is. But it doesn't tell you a1 and b1 individually. And likewise, this one will tell you, tell you a2 squared plus b2 squared square root, but it doesn't give you uh, a2 and b2 individually. So I, I did some fiddling by hand and came up with this function. And my feeling is that this uh, does a really good job of approximating this waveform. Now what is uh, the point here? The point isn't that we can play with uh, sines and cosines and match up uh, patterns, but really the point is that this flute uh, sound actually uh, can be recorded much more condensely by just looking at these coefficients. These coefficients can be represented by very little data compared to this uh, audio file that recorded that flute sound. So if we uh, want, we can use Fourier series to help us uh, compress and digitally manipulate sounds such as the flute. Uh, my challenge to you is to try to do the same thing using the saxophone. And if you want uh, to see the links uh, more, in more detail, you can just download the, the uh, worksheet as I as I said. And by the way, at this website, the worksheet is here, but if you don't want to install Sage and try to um, look at the worksheet inside Sage, there is also this PDF of the worksheet, so you can just read it uh, using the PDF if you're interested. Okay, that's enough of sound. The next application is to try to evaluate um, uh, a sum that's denoted by zeta of 2. The sum is the sum of the reciprocals of the squares. Here you see the, uh, 1 over 1 to the s, 1 over 2 to the s. What I'm talking about is taking s to be 2. So 1 plus 1 over 2 squared plus 1 over 3 squared and so on. What is that sum? Uh, it turns out sums uh, are much more difficult to evaluate than integrals. So if this is an integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the s dx, you could evaluate that pretty easily using calculus, but uh, sums are more difficult, and in fact, if you want to try to figure out when this function is zero, for which s is, is this zero, that is a very famous unsolved problem worth uh, one million dollars, and uh, it's sponsored by the Clay Mathematics Institute. They will pay you one million dollars if you can come up with uh, a, a, a determination of the zeros of zeta of s. I'll state the, the exact hypothesis a little bit li more later, but just need to explain um, that if you take s here, not to be 2, but any complex number, then uh, the problem is that the sum will not converge unless that complex number s has real part greater than 1. So to make this uh, sum to um, converge for a lo to, to define this uh, zeta function so that it, it makes sense for s with real part 
not just greater than one, but a larger range of s, uh, we need to look at not the regular sum of the reciprocals, but the alternating sum of the reciprocals. If you do that, it turns out this alternating sum will converge as long as the real part of s is greater than zero. So much wider range of values. The only difference between this expression and this expression is this tiny factor here. It's not too significant. It won't affect, uh, for example, the zeros. So we now know how to define zeta of s as long as the real part of s is greater than zero. And now we can define the Riemann hypothesis that says that if you have any complex number s, zeta of s is zero. And as if that complex number has real part that it is in between zero and one, then the Riemann hypothesis says that real part has to be equal to one half. And no one knows if that's true or not. It's, it's expected that it is true, but no one knows whether it is or not. It's called the Riemann hypothesis. It's completely unsolved, and it's possibly the most famous and difficult mathematics conjecture that uh, is, is open today. Okay, well, let's move on to trying to evaluate the Riemann zeta function at s equals 2. Um, the trick here is to take the function x squared, but restrict it from minus 1 to 1 and then extend that periodically with period 2. So you have a parabola going from minus 1 to 1 and then you're just extending that parabola. So you have a whole a union of parabolas going along the line. Its period is 2. That's our function. We're going to find the Fourier series of that function. Uh, so here's the formula for the Fourier series and, and the coefficients uh, a n and b n. We talked about the formulas for them earlier. And if you use those formulas and compute a n and b n, you'll get these here, the a n's and b n's. Plug those into here. All the b n's are zero, so there are no sign terms, for example. Uh, but this is two thirds. Plug it into there, we get one third. F of x is x squared, so we have this. Now take x equals one. When you take x equals one, you've got cosine n pi here and cosine n pi here. So you have cosine n pi squared. That's one. If you take x equals 1 here, you've got a 1 there and a 1 third here. Put that over there, you get 2 thirds. So you've got this expression. Now divide by 4 and multiply by pi squared and you get this. So the sum, 1 plus 1 fourth plus 1 ninth plus 1 over 16 plus 1 over 25 and so on, that sum we know converges to pi squared over 6. Uh, here's a real quick derivation of a n. The formula for a n is here, and you can use Sage to compute those integrals, and you can see it's right there. We've got cosine n pi here, which is zero, and cosine n pi, I mean sine n pi, excuse me, there and there, and those are zero. So we just recover this formula here. So Sage can be used to do that calculation. Finally, we're moving on to the most difficult um, application to solve the heat equation using Fourier's method. The heat equation is a partial differential equation, PDE. That means uh, you have a differential equation in a function, u in this case, um, and we're trying to solve for u. So we have uh, the second derivative of u with respect to x and the first derivative of u with respect to t, and they're supposed to differ only by a constant factor, k. This k is a positive constant, it's called the diffusivity constant. And what u of xt is, is the temperature at the point x on a wire of length l at time t. So here's our wire, this dotted line here. We're going to call this endpoint 0, this endpoint over here l, and x is a point on that wire. This wire is a copper wire. We assume it's uh, maybe plastic coated or something. The idea is that heat cannot escape out the middle of the wire, only out the ends. And uh, this, uh, diffus this diffusion equation, this heat equation on top, the PDE, that, that describes the temperature evolution of the wire as T increases. The second equation here describes the initial temperature of the wire. So the temperature at the point X at time T equals zero is F of X. That's the initial temperature. This says the temperature at the point zero for all time T is zero. So that endpoint is zero for all time t. The temperature at the point L 
for all time t is zero. So that point there has zero degrees for all time t. So imagine your mom has this uh, magical oven. You can put a wire in it, and this oven will heat that wire in the middle to any temperature you like. And then, um, but it will also always keep the wire at zero degrees on both ends. Then she turns the oven off, and this will tell you how that wire cools. That's what the heat equation tells you. Okay, let's see how Fourier solved that. Fourier said the first thing to do is define what's, what he calls the sine series of f of x. f of x is defined from zero to L. So what we do is we take f of x and we create an odd function from f of x that's defined from minus L to L. Uh, to get an odd function from minus L to L out of f of x, we take our function f of x, graph it from zero to L, flip that graph about the y-axis, and then flip that graph over the x-axis. Now you have a graph that's going from minus L to L, and it's odd. When you take its Fourier series, you will have no cosine terms, it turns out, only sine terms, and that's why it's called a sine series. I denote this by SS for sine series of F. So this expression right here is the sine series. The BNs are given by this formula here, it turns out. And Fourier's formula for the solution to the heat equation is this expression right here. It says you take this sine series here and tack on to each of those sine terms an exponential. The exponential is e to the minus k, k is a dis diffusivity constant in the PDE. Then you take the coefficient of x inside the sine, you square it, and you multiply by t. That's, the, that's Fourier's formula for the solution. Well, this, uh, a uh, real quick, very quick, 10-second uh, explanation of why Fourier, Fourier's formula works. Uh, first, you take the heat equation with the initial temperature and the boundary conditions, and you replace f of x by its sine series. That's what that is. Now, superposition says, if you can solve this problem here with each of the individual terms, there are infinite number of them, n equals 1, n equals 2, and so on, solve them all and add them together, you'll get the solution to this. So superposition allows us to reduce this problem down to solving all these problems for each n. Now, separation of variables says what we do is we only look for the solutions u of x, t, which are a function of x times a function of t. Let's call it x of x and t of t. We don't know what x of x is. We don't know what t of t is. To find them, what we do is we plug that product into the PDE we try to separate variables, in other words, all the x's on one side, t's on the other side. Now you have a, a separated equation, they have to be equal to a constant, and that allows you to create two ODEs for x of x, one for x of x and one for t of t. Solve them, and then use these conditions here to get more information on the form of those solutions, and you will get x of x, t of t equals to this expression. And so that's the solution. Uh, that's the individual term, and then you add them up using superposition. So that's a 15-second explanation of why Fourier, Fourier's formula works for the zero ends case. Let's do an example. Here's our initial temperature. Our wire is length pi. Uh, temperature is minus 1 from 0 to pi over 2, and then 2 from pi over 2 to pi. L here is pi, as I said. That's the length of the wire. The formula that we had up, uh, up, up there for Bn, right there, tells us that a Bn is this expression here. This only depends on n here. Just plug in various values of n, you'll get various coefficients. Take n equals 1, you get this. Take n equals 2, you get that coefficient. n equals 3, you get this coefficient, and so on. So the first three terms of the Fourier series are just these expressions right here. You can compute as many as you want in uh, Sage, there's a method called sine series coefficient. It'll compute the nth sine series coefficient. And here what we've done is we've had Sage compute the first 50 coefficients and then add them up and then plot them. Uh, so here's our function, f of x. That's the solid blue line. And then we plot this periodic sine series. It's a periodic function with period 2 pi. It goes from minus pi to pi. There's the period right here. Minus pi starts here, pi goes to here. So that's our period. If you want more, you take that block from minus pi to pi and you copy it over here. 
you take that block from minus pi to pi and you copy it over here and you see um, you get the entire graph of the sine series if you really wanted it. We only need this uh, part of the sine series from here to here though. And now we use Fourier's formula for the solution, this one right here. Notice we're going to have to take e to the minus k times this coefficient of x and we square it and multiply by t. Now the formula that we're using um, in our problem here has k equals 1. Okay, So we're going to take uh, e to the minus k with k equals 1. We take the coefficient of x, we square it multiply by t. So that's the exponential factor right there that Euler, I mean, that Fourier said that we should use. We're going to take the first of 50 terms that we already computed, add them up with these extra exponential factors, then plot that for various values of t. When t equals 1, we have this plot right here. That's the sine series itself, for the first 50 terms actually. t equals 1. Or rather, t equals zero is that, is that original. That's the initial temperature. Here's t equals 1 over 20. You can see it's cooled down substantially already, just in 1 20th of a second. That. And then t equals 1 tenth is that next smallest curve. And then t equals 1 fifth. Uh, as you know, that because of Fourier's formula, this temperature is decreasing exponentially rapidly. You can see it in the graph, and it also is kind of intuitive, uh, makes intuitive sense it'll cool off. All right, so that's the end. Those are a few ways you can use SAGE to illustrate the use of Fourier series.